that does the recording. So the recording? Great. And it'll just stop when I click Zoom at the end. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. I think we should start. There'll be some other people coming in, but um, we'll get the conference going. So good morning and welcome to the Center for Media History Conference, which is called Directions in Media History. We're mainly live and in person over the next two days, although you can see John Lecty um, is delivering his paper um, this morning session uh, via Zoom from Melbourne. And we're recording this uh, Zoom session because um, I'm going to send the recording to some of our international collaborators, including Sebastian Lefay, Matthew Graves, and other researchers in Lerma, which is our research center at Ex-Marseille University in France, and they're our newest international partner organization. Also, Chandrika Kaur, who's an honorary associate of the CMH and is currently based at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Here at Macquarie University this morning, I welcome Louise Darson, Deputy De Dean Research and Innovation in the Faculty of Arts, who will shortly open the conference. I also welcome the new chair of the CMH Advisory Board, Philippa McGuinness, who's there, and Advisory Board members, Faye Anderson, and who else is here from the Advisory Board? Yes. Oh, sorry, I've forgotten the name. Mark. Mark. Yeah. Uh, first this morning, I'd like to invite uh, Virginia Madsen, former director of the CMH, and now a deputy director to deliver the acknowledgement of country. Welcome everyone, lovely to see you all. It's gonna be a great um, two days. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Macquarie University land, the Watamatigal clan of the Darug nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future, uh, sorry, and future. Sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, thank you, Virginia. Um, I'd now like to invite Professor Louise Dasson, who's the Deputy Dean Research and Innovation, to formally open the conference. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for the um, generous invitation to, um, to open uh, your two-day conference. Um, just uh, would love to say um, welcome to everybody. Welcome to the members. Welcome to visitors, uh, to board members, etc. Um, I believe that there are people who are online and also maybe some people who are yet, yet to arrive who are meandering through this. Um, <laughs> I've just heard somebody say how much the campus has changed. It is a very transformed campus and so people might, have, might still be making their way here. Um, and there are also guests, I believe, looking at the, the, um, looking at the lineup of papers for the conference, which looks fantastic. Um, I can see that there are people from Monash, people from ANU, people from UTS, who are going to be here as well and from the Australia Council. So welcome to everybody who's a visitor here today at Macquarie University. And of course, um, congratulations to, I wanna say congratulations to you, John, and for the people in the centre for managing to actually pull this together at this time of year. I mean, people are in the thick of marking right now and to, to be able to find time to put a conference together and write papers for that conference is, um, is an amazing achievement in itself. So look, I'll, I'll, I'll be quite brief and I, want to hear a little bit of your paper before your, your discussion John before I have to take off I've got a horrible schedule of meetings all day so um, if I can hear a little bit of that before I go it'll be fantastic um, so just to say that we count ourselves very fortunate in the Faculty of Arts to have the Centre for Media History um, people here don't need to be told what a, a unique entity it is it's been going for 15 years with success it's um, unique uh, in Australia for what it offers. Um, and it's a, a centre that offers us something that's incredibly timely 
um, media, I don't need to tell people here, I'm, I'm a medievalist, so I'm, I can't stand here and tell media scholars about why, why, why media scholarship is important. Um, I'm just kind of, as a medievalist, completely overwhelmed by the archives that you have to work with. You know, it's just enormous, but, um, but incredibly impressive. But, you know, this is a time of, of just media transformation and having people whose uh, research agenda is to continue to hold media to account, to understand its place within uh, the social ecosystem, to understand the, its role in continuing to, um, you know, hold power to account, to reflect back to us our aspirations, uh, our fears, et cetera. Um, it's just an incredibly encompassing phenomenon, media, and to have people who are dedicated to understanding it, interpreting it, and um, continuing to investigate its significance is just a really valuable thing. So um, we're, we're very, very lucky to, to have a concentration of important media researchers within the faculty and to have this event in which you get to um, speak together about the importance of what you're doing and to continue to set an agenda together. So I wish you the very best for the conference, John, and for everybody. Um, and I'll uh, get out of your way and um, wish you a wonderful couple of days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louise, and we greatly appreciate that you've been able to open the conference for us, and you're right, it wasn't easy to get it done at this time of year, but I'm glad that we can go ahead, and I'm looking forward to the next two days. So thanks for coming as Deputy Dean Research and Innovation, and we certainly hope to generate, generate some innovative research for you over the next two days. Uh, before I start, I'd also like to send a thank you to our Administrative Officer, Kate Manlick, who's sitting up the back. Um, many of you will have received emails from her over the last few months, so it's good for you to meet her. She's the one who keeps this whole thing running um, and keeps the got this conference organized as well. So as director of the Center for Media History, I've been very keen to stage a conference such as this one, primarily as an opportunity for CMH members and associate members who are here to present their current research in media history and to receive feedback from other members in lengthy discussion periods. Now, there are quite a few participants in the conference who aren't CMH members, and that's fine too. Uh, we know most of you and we welcome you. We don't discriminate. Uh, and perhaps after the conference, we'll even sign you up as honorary associates. But the main goal of the conference, I think, is to engage in an extended discussion of current research conducted within the Center for Media History. So th to this end, um, we've organized this conference with no parallel sessions because we want everybody to hear everyone else's paper as much as possible. Also, there are at least 10 minutes allocated for audience response and discussion after each paper, and sessions are not crowded. You'll see there's a program on paper at the back there for those who would like to um, get a copy of it, and also of all the abstracts. Um, there's a panel on Friday afternoon on documentary, which does have four, sessions, four speakers, but for every other session, it's either two, like this current one, or three. That means there'll be ample time within each session for audience members to contribute to a discussion on the theme of that session. Finally, this conference doesn't have a keynote address. Uh, the theme of the conference is directions in media history, and there's no key or prescribed direction that our research and our discussion should take. In place of a keynote, I'll now give a brief opening address, whose main function is to chart some of the expansive range of directions that research into media history may take within our Center for Media History. So media history has traditionally concerned itself with mass media, uh, broadcasting and the press. Radio broadcasting replaced the earlier use of radio technology as a point-to-point -point communication in which amateur radio operators initially sent and received messages, an early 20th century precursor to social media. We can assign dates to the beginning of broadcasting, and there are some um, very experienced radio scholars here, including Virginia and Bridget, so let's hope I get these dates right. Uh, 1923 in Australia, 1922 in the US with the advent of commercial radio stations, and 1923 in Britain with the launch of the BBC. Broadcasting created a new form of mass audience who listened to the flow of programming 
broadcast by stations through day and night. Television adopted many of the radio program types to the new audiovisual technology, also adopted the mass audience and the idea of programming flow. We can assign dates to this development too, 1956 in Australia, of course, so that the Melbourne Olympic Games could be televised. But so far, this concerns only broadcasting history in the 20th century. Mass media and mass audience or readership begins far earlier with the first newspapers. The mechanical printing press developed by Gutenberg was producing many copies of printed works by the end of the 15th century, notably Bibles, but also other books, pamphlets, and the earliest news sheets. The first weekly newspaper, a copy reproduced here, was printed in Germany in 1609. And you'll notice that the Gothic font of these mastheads has a kind of continuity in the mastheads of uh, the New York Times and Sydney Morning Herald which suggests a continuity with the early printed news publications that were done largely in Gothic. Many news publications remain little more than news sheets, but these printed publications played a crucial role in the growth of the public sphere, specifically in the coffee houses, the first of which opened in 1650, which for Habermas housed the ideal speech acts within a free public sphere, characteristic of enlightenment and a functioning democracy. The first magazine, the word deriving from the Arabic word for storehouse, followed in 1731. That's the first issue. Elizabeth Eisenstein rightly considered the printing press as the most radical transformation in the condition of intellectual life in Western civilization. Some of the many consequences of the printing press were the growth of scientific literature and research, the reformation and nationalism, both fermented with the aid of printed pamphlets, and the advent with the growth of literacy of a mass readership. And as well, the pressure in the 18th century to protect authors' rights in the form of copyright. But this history of the printing press is too limited and too Western-centric. A long-span media history should be a global, not Eurocentric history. In China, woodblock printing was in use as early as the third century and widely used to print texts by the seventh century. Texts were printed on paper, made in China since the first century, and it took a thousand years before paper eventually reached Europe. One such text was the Dibao, described as a metropolitan gazette. In reality, an official newsletter circulated among the elite groups within the administration of the empire. The news sheet therefore did not originate in the European Enlightenment, coffee houses, but in China almost a millennium earlier. How far back can media history go? Handwritten and copied texts made before the invention of the printing press lacked the mass readership, uh, which was made possible by mechanical reproduction, but they had a readership nevertheless, if only a tiny privileged and literate section of society. So here, Louise, I even mentioned medieval culture. Medieval manuscript culture bequeathed some famous hand copied texts and also elaborated notions of the writer, namely the auctor or authority and the scriptor or copyist, that eventually morphed into the modern author. Further back in the ancient world, Julius Caesar ordered the public posting of Acta in about 59 BC, which were daily handwritten news bulletins that were a precursor to news sheets and newspapers. The first phonetic script, cuneiform writing invented in Mesopotamia by 3000 BC, was preserved in dried clay tablets about the size of smartphones. You can see handheld here. These tablets were first used for administrative record keeping, but soon also preserved creative works, including poems, verse epics, such as the Gilgamesh. And there are some very good specimens in the History Museum downstairs. In his book, The Author, published in 2005, Andrew Bennett ponders who was the first author in Western civilization. Contenders are Homer and Hesiod, both thought to live around 700 BC. But a work of global history, or a history of authorship, or a media history, broadly defined, which was written today, would not adopt such a Eurocentric perspective. It would also go back much further than Homer, to the oral traditions of storytelling in traditional societies, including those of indigenous peoples. The great verse epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are understood today as the culmination of a profound oral storytelling tradition in which poets memorized large section, sections of the work and handed them down to the next generation of storytellers. 
Homer, in inverted commas, is nothing more than a name given to the transcription of these works, converting an oral tradition into written texts in the 8th century BC. The historian of orality and literacy, Walter J. Ong, has said of writing that more than any other invention, it transformed human consciousness. One of the consequences of this radical transformation was the creation of the very idea of the individual named author, a major break from the collective anonymous storytelling of the oral tradition. If Bennett had looked further back in history than Homer, he would have in fact discovered the world's first poet known by name, an Akkadian high priestess named Enheduanna, who lived from about 2285 BC to 2250. Enheduanna wrote poetry, creating templates for poems, psalms, and hymns used by later poets. Many of her works inscribed on clay tablets were signed with her name. And there's even this surviving uh, portrait of her, testament to her eminent status in Akkadian society. In his book, A History of Reading, Manguel finds the very idea of the author is born here. When the poet signed her name at the end of the tablet, this identified the I in the text with a specific person, thereby creating a character, the author, for the reader to engage with. Manguel concludes that this device, invented at the beginning of literature, is still with us more than 4,000 years later. But perhaps we've gone too far back. Um, let's come back to something a bit more recent. When the most pressing need for contemporary studies in media history is to engage with a much more recent development, the rise of online media and social media. We can assign a date for this, 1993, when the World Wide Web was made available for commercial use, and that was followed by the extremely rapid growth in websites throughout the 1990s. This surge in online activity created enormous challenges for the press, long celebrated as the fourth estate and a crucial factor in the successful functioning of democratic society. Suddenly the press became a state 4.0, and the most urgent consequence of the new online world was the catastrophic decline in newspapers. There was even a website called Newspaper Death Watch, which was set up to document, I know it's a bit morbid, to set up to document the closure of newspapers around the world while her heralding the birth of online news outlets. News became available online for free, while advertisers switched to websites which were much cheaper and provided access to far more viewers than did print newspapers. One prognosis of the press has predicted that the very last print newspaper will roll off the presses in 2043. The only way for major newspapers to survive was to migrate online and create a website version of themselves. In the triumphant rhetoric of Silicon Valley with its language of disruption and its contempt for tradition, newspapers along with broadcast media were given the patronizing descriptor of legacy media, with the strong implication that legacy media would soon go the way of legacy animals, such as the dinosaur and the dodo bird. There's one proviso to this sketch of recent media history. The narrative of catastrophic decline of newspapers may be true of Western countries, but it's not universal. In India, there are at least 85,000 individual print newspapers and circulation is booming. The Times of India has a daily circulation of over 3 million and is the largest of any English language paper in the world. Recent global media history then should pay attention to non-Western media, such as Indian newspapers, informing global perspective. One challenge for media historians is to determine if online news outlets, such as smh.com.au, represent a discontinuity with their print predecessors or whether they're simply the continuation of news by new technological means. A case could be made that a news website is a new improved version of a newspaper in that it offers the latest news as it happens, as well as yesterday's news. It util utilizes video as well as still images and provides for far greater interaction by readers. Critics of the online version, however, may point to the well-documented deficit in reader <clears throat> comprehension while reading from a screen and trying to maintain attention, as well as the temptation for editors to place more sensational, entertaining news items at the top of the screen, given the instant measure of a news item's popularity available to editors in the item's number of hits. The next major development in online media was Web 2.0, which placed greater emphasis on user access and user content and coincided in 
2004 with the launch of Facebook. The rapid escalation of social media in the decade following 2004 prompted radical new formulations of the audience, now conceptualized as active users of online media, rather than the people formerly known as the audience. Great claims were made for the liberating potential of social media, blogs, and other forms of online media, giving voice to millions and gigantically expanding the public sphere. New terms such as producer and prosumer were created to signify the role of users in both consuming and producing social media. Online media were now celebrated as a vast collective intelligence, the wisdom of the crowd, an army of Davids, here comes everybody, and an enhancement of democracy. But this all changed in 2016, when it was revealed that Cambridge Analytica paid for user data from Facebook and attempted to influence citizens' votes in the US presidential election. Other, re <coughs> re other revelations of the harvesting and exploitation of user data by big tech corporations as Google, Facebook, Apple, and the others were now known, led to much more critical evaluations including Zuboff's charge of surveillance capitalism. While the unchecked misinformation and conspiracy theories flourishing on Twitter and other social media platforms was now seen as a danger to democracy. Another challenge for media historians is to determine whether social media are in fact media. Certainly Zuckerberg and other CEOs of social media platforms insist that they're not. They're only technology companies or simply platforms, not media organizations. Yet, we know that the great majority of people, especially young people, receive almost the entire diet of news from the news feeds of social media platforms. Social media could also be, be described as parasite media, in that for many years, they brazenly took news created by journalists in news organizations and added it to their news feeds without payment to the originating source. Following years of complaint from news organizations, the Australian government passed legislation last year compelling Facebook and Google to pay news organizations for content channeled into their news feeds. Social media can also be considered an online form of commercial media. Like commercial media, the business model of social media depends almost entirely on advertising. Whereas commercial broadcast media sells access to its mass audience to advertisers, Social media has the distinct advantage of being able to offer to advertisers direct access to individual users, an access informed by knowledge of users' preferences, likes, and consumer spending patterns, all available in harvested user data. Another crucial development in online media came in 2006 with the availability of streaming technology, which enabled the rise to prominence of Spotify and Netflix. There's no doubt that Netflix has led a disruption of the TV and film industries. The question again arises for media historians. Is Netflix the continuation of television by the new technological means of streaming, or is it a fundamentally different technological form and therefore a new type of media? Proponents of the discontinuity point of view can point to the distinct differences in viewing behavior. When a viewer streams a TV program or film on Netflix, they are calling up this item from the database. In fact, they can call up an entire series and view the lot in one binge viewing session. This is computer-based based viewing with the database central to the technology in the way identified by Manovich in his book, Lang The Language of New Media. <clears throat> the database is the base of all online media. A viewer of broadcast TV, by contrast, depends on the station's programming schedule and its flow to watch desired programs unless they have a video recording device which allows for time shifting. But a viewer of Netflix arranges their own viewing schedule by summoning items from the database to watch whenever they please. Recently, however, Netflix and the other streaming platforms have moved away from making entire series of popular TV programs available at once, instead releasing new episodes at the same time weekly, which is a scheduling strategy roughly approximating in the streaming context the old scheduling strategy of broadcast TV. The dominant approach to media history in the British media studies tradition in which many of us have been trained is a political economy, ideological analysis perspective on the media industry and its history. As developed by theorists such as Raymond Williams, Stuart Hall, Angela McRobbie, and many others, 
this British tradition focused on the politi political economy of the media industry, the ownership, control, and regulation of media in historical context, as well as a diagnosis of the social or ideological effects of media output. Supported by a conception of power knowledge borrowed from Foucault, this is a broadly con social constructivist approach, analyzing the ways in which media discourses are inflected by various determinants of social power and knowledge. One missing component in the British tradition, however, was a focus on the technology of media and the ways in which properties of a media technology may shape the cultural and political influences of that media form. This approach was elaborated in a rival English speaking media studies tradition known as the Toronto School. Its most famous or infamous proponent was Marshall McLuhan, who proposed with his dictum that the medium is a message or massage that to understand a medium's cultural impact, you must consider the specific properties of that media technology. This approach was widely rejected within the British tradition, criticized by Williams and others as a species of technological determinism. However, as internet-based media proliferated, it became apparent that the properties of internet technology were fundamental to the cultural impact of online media, even to the shaping of a new form of audience. The British tradition responded by borrowing from psychology the rather clumsy, clumsy term affordance uh, to denote the latent potential of technologies, that is, their properties. One other media history tradition that absorbed the medium as the message approach of the Toronto School and fused it with Foucault's concept of the archaeology of knowledge and power knowledge is the German tradition of media archaeology. And I know. Um, Sean Lecty will, in this session, refer to some of these theorists. Theorists including uh, Friedrich Kittler and Wolfgang Ernst have pursued an investigation of the agency of the machine in a media history context. The archive has been central to much of the research in the media archaeology school, even into the digital age. Ernst conducted an analysis of the digital archive in his 2013 book, Digital Media, Memory and the Archive. Another feature of media archaeology is its interdisciplinary nature, incorporating the work of media artists who explore the history of media technologies in artworks. A recent theoretical development in British media studies is hands-on media history, um, an approach to media which borrows heavily from media archaeology's emphasis on media technology and its expression in media arts. One advantage of a focus on the specific properties of media technologies is that it can assist in charting, charting media's cultural influence through history. The first televised public debate in the US was held in 1960 between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. JFK was widely held to have won that debate, primarily because his youthful and energetic good looks were extremely telegenic, especially in close-up, which is the staple of the TV form. Nixon, by contrast, on TV appeared older, shifty, and possessed of a five o'clock shadow, distinctly untelegenic. The majority of those listening to that same debate on radio deemed Nixon to be the winner, but in 1960, TV was the dominant media form in the US, and JFK is generally characterized as the first TV president, that is, a politician whose appearance fitted winningly with the properties of the TV medium. In 2016, by contrast, social media had become the dominant media form. Its properties encourage rampant self-promotion by the user and the curation of an idealized, even fantastic version of the self. In this regard, this orange monstrosity may be deemed the first Twitter president. It was highly significant that Mr. Orange sought to bypass the traditional media altogether, disparaging press and media coverage of him as fake news. The function of the press is fourth estate, independent of government, and thereby an important component in the democratic process was undercut. In its place was the use of social media as political instrument, not as news, but as pure propaganda. And that continues. When we write media history in 2022, then, we have multiple means, approaches, and theories to draw on. We may conduct an analysis focused on the political political economy of media in industries and their history. We may apply critical discourse analysis to the interpretation of media texts, revealing the inflections of power in those texts. We may focus on the specific properties of media technologies and their cultural effects. 
The media histories we write may be informed by feminism, by queer theory, by post-colonialism, or by critical race theory. We may undertake media history research while writing histories more broadly defined as cultural history, literary history, or art history. We may focus on recent online media, social media, electronic arts, or the digital humanities. We may conduct practice-based research expressing research into media history in the creative forms of film, radio, documentary, podcast, fiction, or online media. Many of these diverse approaches will be put into use over the next two days in the papers presented today and tomorrow, which will showcase research into media history. I greatly look forward to hearing all those presentations. And now I'm going to segue into being the chair of our first session, which is theoretical directions. And I'll ask Virginia to come up. <laughs> 